For the past two years, I've done all of my astrophotography with a Nikon D750, iOptron Skyguider Pro, and actually a Tamron 150-600mm to lens. And this allowed me to get some really amazing images, but I was always never really that amazed by the setup. So recently, Agena Astro was kind enough to reach out, and they sent me a William Optic Space Cat telescope to review. And I was really impressed by the quality of this telescope. So throughout this review, we're going to look at all the different aspects of the Space Cat. And then by the end of the review, you'll have a pretty clear idea if this is a good investment for you or not. Now before we get into the review, I want to touch on the different variants of this telescope because that can get kind of confusing. So in early February, uh, William Optics released their first edition, which was the Red Cat 51. That went on to a lot of critical success. And then in September 2019, they released an updated version. And the updated version has a few noticeable improvements, but there's also now the Space Cat. So to be clear, what I'm reviewing is the September 2019 version. Uh, you can either get the Red Cat or the Space Cat. They're both the same thing, they just have different colors. Space Cat is gray, Red Cat is obviously red. Uh, but that's what we're going to be looking at in today's video. Really the main visual difference is just that the dovetail plate is noticeably longer on the newer versions. So why don't we just take this guy off here and get started. And you can see here the Space Cat is a very compact, lightweight, and small telescope. It almost looks like a 70 to 200 millimeter lens if you're a photographer. And that's really what I was comparing it to was actually my Tamron 70 to 200 because that's what I normally use a lot as well at night. But here's the telescope. And of course, the first thing to look at is the dovetail plate. And this was one area that I thought was really interesting because not only is it a dovetail plate, it's also an Arca Swiss plate. So what you can do, if you look on the bottom here, there's two sets of screws. You can unscrew these, take the whole dovetail plate off, and then reattach it upside down. At that point, you can put this now on any Arca Swiss ball head. So for you photographers out there, if you want to use this as like a birding lens or something like that, this is a great option. Or if you just have an Arca Swiss mount, you can go that route as well. Uh, it's really nice though that they have that function built in. And another cool thing with the dovetail plate is that you can actually move these screws to a bunch of different locations and that's going to help with your balancing. Now right now, I've got a really lightweight little demo camera, but if you had a massive like D 850, for example, it's going to take up a lot more space, be a lot heavier. So you can move the entire dovetail plate forwards or backwards to help with the balance. And in this case, I don't really have to worry about it. You'd want to watch out though, because if you try and go further back and you've got a battery grip, it's probably going to run into that. So it's not perfect in that regard uh, if you've got a big battery grip. But generally, I recommend taking off any kind of battery grips anyway. So that's the first aspect of the Space Cat is simply the dovetail plate. And I really enjoy using that. It is pretty long, but it doesn't add too much weight to it at all. And, you know, you could even just take the screws out and reuse this dovetail plate on another setup if you want to go that route. So it's kind of nice if you get that included as well. Moving on, we have just the lens cap here. This is one of the things I love about William Optics is they've really thought through every aspect very thoroughly. So I'm going to put this back on here, but the uh, lens cap actually has a Batonov mask built in. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that yet, essentially a Batonov mask is just a little piece of plastic usually with a bunch of lines in it. So again, we have the lens cap here. I'm gonna unscrew it. And then when we take it off, we'll be able to see the Batonov mask inside. And here we go. This is the Batonov mask, just a little bunch of lines in there. And the cool thing is when we put this on the front of our Space Cat, this is gonna allow us to focus a lot easier at night because as I'm sure you're aware, when we're trying to focus at night, really all we have is just some stars and we're trying to make those stars as small as possible and that can be very difficult for a lot of people but when you have the batonov mask on here what you're looking for is actually the design on the logo so if you look very closely the space cat has these whiskers and that's another just cool little design that they've done at william optics this whisker pattern is the same as the batonov mask so what i'm in other words what i'm trying to say is that if you get all three of those lines lined up perfectly, that means your stars are sharp and in focus. But if that line in the middle is a little high or low, it's not dead center, then that indicates your stars are out of focus. So you can make some tweaks there. Uh, so that's one of the really nice benefits of getting the Space Cat is that you can have that built-in Batonov mask, and that should make your focusing a lot easier at night. Moving on, let's talk about the lens hood itself. This is another great thing 
about the Space Cat in that it's so versatile because, you know, when you have a big telephoto lens on here, it can take up a lot of space in your bag. But with the lens hood here, it comes essentially with three different configurations. This is the initial configuration. It's hiding the focusing ring, the tension ring, and then the front element. But once you've unscrewed it now, you can screw it here on the front. And that's gonna act as a little bit of protection, maybe even some protection from the dew as well to prevent that from settling on the front of your lens. So you can go that route, you can leave it off completely. And I would take it off completely if you're gonna be out in kind of a breezy night, because that wind's gonna hit there and potentially shake your setup more. So in that case, I would leave it off. But here you can see the telescope itself is pretty small and compact. Again, it's very similar to a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. Next, I wanna to touch on the focus ring. This is a helical focuser. And for those of you who are used to photography, it's just like a, a focusing ring on any lens. Uh, but that's gonna be our main ring here, is the focusing ring. There's also a smaller ring up higher, that is the tension ring. And with that, you can either loosen it or tighten it. It should speed up how easy it is to turn the focusing ring. So the reason you would adjust that is most likely, let's say you want to photograph some birds out here in the prairie, you can loosen the tension ring. And then when you're focusing manually, you can zoom in and out a lot easier. But since we're going to be shooting at night, we want to have a much more precise focus. So that's when I would tighten the tension ring. And now it's going to move a little bit smoother. Now, in terms of focusing, it's pretty easy to do at night, especially because there's a lot of very fine markings right around infinity. And once you find the focus, you pretty much know from then on exactly where to go. And that's really all there is to the focusing system. It's not very complex. The only downside is that just like with any telephoto lens, if you just move this even just a hair, it's going to throw off your focus and your stars will no longer be sharp. So that's something you got to watch out for. If you accidentally bump it, it might screw things up. Uh, and also, uh, when I'm using live view and I've got my Badenov mask on here, it's kind of hard to see the stars. So I have to take a short test photo to make sure everything is focused. Now, if you have a newer mirrorless camera with those live view systems, they're usually much more sensitive in low light. So in that case, you could probably just do your focusing in real time using live view. But for those of us with the older DSLRs, again, I'm on the Nikon D750, we'll, it'll just take us a little bit more time to focus, but it is still nice to have that Badenov mask. And the focusing is pretty precise here with the Space Cat. Now, moving here towards the back, you'll see that there's a series of numbers all around here in a circle from zero to 350. And that is the field rotator. And according to the official documentation, that's what you're gonna use for creating mosaics uh, of the night sky. And it's gonna work almost the same as the lens collar uh, screw here. So if you loosen the field rotator screw, you can now rotate your DSLR left and right. And honestly, the only reason I even do that is let's say I'm focusing on an object that's in a weird position in the night sky. Let's say somewhere up over here, right? Now, instead of having to crane my neck to look through the camera when it's at this weird angle, you know, I can just loosen the field rotator screw, turn my camera around, and now it's completely uh, horizontal and that's gonna make things easier. Now you could also just do that with the lens collar screw here like you normally would, but for me, the field rotator screw is a lot easier. So that's what I'd recommend using that for. And again, the, the official reason you'd want to use that is for mosaics, but for me, my field of view is so wide anyway, I don't really need to worry about it for that. Next, I want to show you how to actually connect your DSLR to the Space Cat. And this is actually the one area where I had a lot of problems, unfortunately. So if you take your camera off or if you haven't attached it yet, this is just a demo camera, so we won't worry about it. <laughs> uh, the way this is gonna work is you're going to also need to get a 48 millimeter T-mount adapter. Uh, and you wanna get the specific one for your camera, whether you're on Fuji, Nikon, Sony, Canon, whatever. You wanna make sure you get that. And they will be specific usually for the Space Cat. But you can see here, I'm already having some problems where it's just kind of a pain, this whole system, the way they've done it, because We'll have to zoom in here, but you've essentially got a thread that goes directly into the telescope and then you thread the T-mount adapter into that. And with all these different threads, things tend to get loosened and tightened when you don't intend them to. And in this case, it's just hard to get a grip on the inner thread, which means unfortunately I have to unscrew both of them. And then once I've done that, 
I can unscrew the T-mount from there. So it's just kind of a little bit of a pain with the T-mount adapter. That's honestly the one area where I really had problems with this. And for now, I'll just leave it on here, but you can see uh, the T-mount will screw directly into this. And while we've gotten this pulled apart, there's actually a two inch filter thread in here right against the rear element. So for those of you with a dedicated astronomy camera and maybe your narrow band or broadband filters, RGB, if you've got those two inch filters, you can easily install them right here on the back of the space cat. So that can really help out as well. And I know I'm personally thinking about getting a ZWO camera at some point with a set of filters. So that'll be nice to have all that right there. So moving on, really what I wanted to talk about was the T-mount adapter. And the original problem I had is that when I had this T-mount adapter locked on here, I would grab my DSLR, I would line up the white dots, and then I would turn it until, and you can even see it right now, it's now the telescope's turning and the T-mount's turning. It's just overly uh, painful to get everything nice and tight. But the, the main problem I'm getting at is that when I was attaching the T-mount adapter, it never clicked into place. So by now I'm sure you're aware, when you're attaching a lens, it normally locks in a place at a certain point. And then at that point, no matter how much you turn it, it's not gonna come off of the DSLR until you press the lens release button, and then you can take it off. Now the problem I was having is that when I would tighten the T-mount adapter, it would never actually lock in. And the first night I was doing that, the whole thing started to swing loose like that, and I freaked out, as most people would. And after using that for about two or three weeks, I'm like, there's gotta be something wrong here. So I reached out to William Optics via email. I said, hey, you know, I got this T-mount adapter here. And for whatever reason, it never really locks onto my DSLR. I'm not sure what's going on. I waited a week, I never heard back from them, which I thought was weird. I thought they had good customer service. And then uh, I sent them in a message on their Facebook page. I saw that they read it, but they never replied there either. And it took over a week, I never heard anything. So I was a bit disappointed in their customer service. I would have at least expected, you know, hey, sorry about that. Uh, some type of response, but there's nothing. So that would be really my one problem with William Optics is that their customer service was oddly lacking. And also just the fact that the T-mount was in fact effective. The new T-mount I do have on here. And this version <laughs> uh, goes right on. And I'm gonna do this so you can actually hear it. I don't know how well you actually heard that, but uh, it clicked into place at that point. So the new T-mount works fine, no problems at all. And I did have actually one of my students emailed me and they said, hey, my T-mount isn't locking into place. I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. So I thought I'd bring that up to everybody's attention. Maybe you're having the same problem. If you are, contact your dealer directly, whether that's a Gina Astro, High Point Scientific, whoever. But that is the only problem I really had with this base cut is that T-mount adapter was not it was defective essentially, but a Genia Astro uh, sent me the new one and it works fine. Now that we've covered the different aspects of the Space Cat, I want to talk about my actual shooting experience because that's obviously really what you came here to see. Now, uh, when I first got the Space Cat back in October, I went out and photographed the Pleiades. That was my first real object, super easy to find. And what I immediately noticed is that the 250 millimeter focal length is perfect, especially if you're kind of just getting into astrophotography because on a full frame camera, 250 millimeters is wide enough that you can still get a pretty good view of the night sky. It's not too zoomed in. And that's really what causes people a lot of problems, especially beginners, is if you're trying to find something like the Veil Nebula, it's 600 millimeters or 400 millimeters. It can be very difficult, but at 250 millimeters, you get a wider view of the sky and it just makes things a lot easier. Now that is, Really, the only problem I do have with the Space Cat is the focal length at 250 millimeters on my full frame camera. I think it's a little bit too wide, honestly. But the great thing is, if you've got a crop sensor camera like a Nikon D5600 or a Canon Rebel, something like that, you're going to get a essentially a free magnification of 1.5 on Nikon or 1.6 on Canon. In other words, on your camera, this telescope is going to look more like 350 or 400 millimeters. And for me, that's one of the best focal lengths for the various deep space objects that I cover in my courses. So with that in mind, you know, if you already have a crop sensor camera, this is a great option. If you're on full frame though, again, you might find it to be a little bit wide. 
And for those of you with a dedicated Astro camera like the ZWO ASI 1600, I would argue that's actually one of the best things you can do is pair that with a space cap because at that point, you're almost going to be looking at about 500 millimeters because if we take 250 times two, which is the crop factor of that specific camera, we got 500 and that's going to give you a lot of zoom. So regardless of what you're photographing, it's going to fill the frame nicely and you're going to get some really awesome detailed photos. Another downside of using a full frame camera with the space cat is that you're going to be capturing the full image circle. And that opens up a few different problems. The first is the vignette. And if we look here at this photo, I've stretched it very drastically in camera raw, so you can actually see the vignette properly. But there it is. It's not too extreme, but there's definitely a noticeable vignette in the corners. And if you're using something like a crop sensor camera or the dedicated astro cameras, there's going to be cropped in essentially to the center of the frame and you won't see the vignette. So that's just another benefit of using a smaller sensor. And also if we look at the extreme corners with the space cap, the stars do have a very slight amount of coma or just or the star distortion, but it's really not a big deal. But again, if you're using crop sensor camera, that's going to be completely cropped out of the frame anyway. So getting back to my first shooting experience, uh, my first object I decided to photograph was the Pleiades. And when I took my first test photo, I was a little bit worried because right in the center of the frame, there's a big old dust spot. And I immediately thought, oh crap, there's something wrong with the telescope. There must be some dust either on the front of the rear element or maybe inside. But then I remembered if you're seeing any kind of dust in your images, it's on your camera's sensor. And with that in mind, uh, because the rear element is kind of like out here, and normally if using like a, a 70-200, it'd be closer to the camera sensor. In other words, the further away it is from your camera sensor, the rear element, the more large those dust spots are going to appear in the frame. And that's why I never noticed that there was any dust on my sensor before, because it normally just completely blurs out. But with a space cat, the dust was noticeable in the image. And as somebody who spends six months traveling around the road and I'm constantly switching lenses, that's something I got to watch out for because there'd be nothing worse than setting up, taking all your photos at night, then realizing you got dust spots everywhere. Now, with that in mind, you could take flat frames. There's a lot of videos on that. I also talk about that in my various courses. And the flat frames will help to automatically remove that dust from your photos. But for me, I don't want to deal with flat frames if I don't have to, especially specific dust patterns. So with that in mind, just keep your sensor clean and you won't have to worry about it. Uh, there's also a lot of videos on how to clean your sensor. It's not a big deal. I used to be afraid to do it. Then I did it two or three times and it's not a problem. So that's something else to keep in mind. Moving on though, once I saw that dust spot, I'm saying, well, this is just my first test night, so I'm not going to worry about it. But I did my focusing, again, using the Batnov mask. That only took me about 30 seconds to get a sharp image, which is a little bit faster than I would have had with the just manual, moving it back and forth and trying to find the star as small as possible. And with the Batnov mask, you can make sure that it's actually sharp just by seeing those uh, very distinct patterns with the lines. So once I had everything focused, I was ready to go. Now I needed to find my object. And since I was photographing the Pleiades, it really wasn't a big deal to find the Pleiades. But again, if you're going to be photographing something like the Rosette Nebula, which is kind of dim, not a lot of contrast, or the Veil Nebula, this 250 millimeter focal length will help you. Uh, that is one of the benefits, though, of having like a 150 to 600 or a 70 to 200, is that you can start zoomed out, you can scan for the sky until you find the object, then from there you can zoom in. But with a fixed focal length, like every telescope, you're just limited to that narrow little window, and that makes finding the objects more difficult. But again, 250 millimeters wide enough that you shouldn't have too much trouble even if you're a beginner. All right, well, that's about all I have for you in today's review of the William Optics Space Cat Telescope. Again, it's the same thing as the Red Cat, just with a gray paint job. And this is also the September 2019 release, not the early 2019 release. Just to recap all the most important points to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, the first thing I love is just the overall design of the Space Cat, because as somebody who's only really ever used a telephoto lens, those aren't really built for astrophotography. I mean, you can use them, but it was just so nice to really see that they thought through everything over at William Optics from the reversible lens hood, which you can take off if it's a little bit windy or leave it on there for some protection or reverse it to reduce the pack size. They have the Batnov mask that's built into the front cap. That's going to help you with focusing and make sure you actually do have sharp stars. There's also the field rotator, which you can do uh, mosaics with. But for me, like I said, I just use it to turn the camera. That way I have a flat field and I don't have to crack my neck to look through the camera. And then 
Of course, we have the focusing ring here, very similar to a telephoto lens, but with the addition of the tension ring, it'll help to speed up or slow down that focus, and that can help you just make sure you're doing very precise adjustments. Another thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the Space Cat does come with its own padded carrying case. And this is great if you're like me and you already have your hard cases completely jam-packed full of camera gear. You can safely transport it on your, onto your shooting locations and it looks nice laying around the house as well. In terms of image quality, the Space Cat does a really nice job. The only downside is that if you are using a full frame camera like I am, you're gonna have a little bit of vignette in the corners and just a very slight amount of star distortion. However, if you take your flat frames, you can just cancel out the vignette anyway, and the star distortion is really nothing to worry about. Uh, and if you're gonna be using a crop sensor camera or a dedicated astro camera, in that case, you're only gonna be seeing the very center of the image frame, and you won't have any vignette or star distortion at all. And that's really how I'd recommend using the Space Cat, because when you have the smaller sensors, you're gonna get more magnification, a narrower field of view. In other words, the Andromeda Galaxy or the Orion Nebula is really gonna fill the frame it's going to look a lot cooler than it does on my full frame camera where they're kind of small and not as impressive. And honestly, the only downside I can say for the Space Cat is simply the T-mount adapter, which was defective. Now that I have a working one, it's not really a problem. Although, as I mentioned, I still don't necessarily love the design because when you go to tighten everything down, it's possible still that this can unscrew the T-mount from the, the rear element here. So it's still not perfect, but uh, the main thing I wanted to bring up there was just that you might have a defective T-mount if you bought one of your uh, Red Cat or Space Cat. So make sure that it does lock into place. If not, contact your dealer because, again, like I said, William Optics was oddly quiet when I emailed them and tried to get in touch. So I'm not sure what's going on with their customer service, but that would be another negative strike I'd give them. Customer service wasn't great. The defective team out but again a gina astro was great they sent me out a new one no problem and then uh, the only other downside between those two things is just the focal length on the full frame camera i think 250 millimeters is a bit wide so if you're like me and you're using a full frame camera you might want to consider getting a dedicated astro camera i think this would be the perfect option for that and in fact uh one of my buddies from new zealand Stu, he sent me some photos he took with his Red Cat with a ZWO ASI 1600 and those photos were just breathtaking. I think that's going to be one of my next investments is a dedicated astro camera and I compare it right with the Space Cat and get really awesome results. So that's all I have for you in today's review. I hope you learned a lot about the Space Cat or the Red Cat and now you can make a better more informed decision if you're thinking about getting a telescope. So my final word is that if you're looking to get your first telescope like I was the Space Cat is a fantastic option, especially if you're going to be using the Sky Guider Pro or Star Adventure. It's not very heavy at all. You'll have no problem with either of those trackers. And this is kind of like a future-proof telescope because if you get more in astrophotography, you get those uh, filters, you get a monochrome little CCD-style camera, again, like the ZWO ASI 1600 or one of the tons and tons of other ones. That'll work perfectly with the Space Cat, really even better than the DSLR would. And it's just going to grow with you as you get more into this hobby if you're still a beginner. And with that in mind, I have no hesitations re recommending the William Optics Space Cat or the Red Cat if you want to get more into astrophotography.